Good morning. It's great to see you this morning. Welcome to those that are joining us in person in the sanctuary, the Fellowship Hall, and welcome to those that are joining online. I'm quickly uh, make a few announcements. want to make sure that everybody knows next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, we will have local church conference in the Fellowship Hall uh, where we elect board members. Uh, we uh, approve our budget for the, the coming year. Uh, we'll discuss a couple other things as well, a couple reports, things along that line. Uh, but uh, an important night that uh, definitely encourage members to attend. But it's also open for non-members to be able to attend. You can't vote or speak into the process, but you can definitely listen and be able to hear what's going on, what's uh, what's happening, what's what has happened, as well as some things that are uh, coming in the next uh, several months as well and so uh, make sure that you put that on your calendar next Sunday night six o'clock also there are a couple different signups that are available in the lobby you can sign up for the uh, loons game it will actually be the Pepiginos Picantes del Norte for that night um, can you guys say that Pepiginos Picantes del Norte you gotta work on it so next Sunday night, we've, we've got a good group already signed up. Love to have, uh, I'm, my goal is 40, and uh, we, we're a little over 20 that are already signed up, and I know that there are about another 10 more that have said that they're planning to go. They just haven't signed up yet. Uh, but I'm hoping to, to get to 40. Uh, I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, but I'd be excited to have the 30 of us or whatever. Um, July 22nd, 1250 a person, and you're going to get plenty of food and drink and everything that we're going to help take care of through the family ministry team. So sign up. Also, VBX uh, sign up for 2022 is now available. The lobby or online. It's going to have a great year. It's called Surf Camp this year. And we're going to learn about making waves. And I think it's going to be a pretty gnarly time. And we're going to hang 10. So um, it's, going be, it's going to be fun, fun stuff. But anyway, if you have any questions of any of that, see me after service. One final thing before I jump into God's Word, I do want to make sure that you know that today is the first Sunday of the month, and so we will be partaking of the Lord's Supper, communion this morning uh, after, the, after the sermon. And so uh, if you didn't grab your elements or you're joining us online, if you want to grab some grape juice, if you have some available in uh, crackers, that would work. Uh, it's not so much about the elements, it's about the heart and us really reflecting on what Christ has done for us. And so we'll take time for that later after the message. I said sermon, and uh, that may not be the best way to describe what we're going to do today. Um, I'm not going to preach. Is that right? I, I'm going to more so do a Bible study this morning. As I looked at the passage and spent hours looking at the passage and studying uh, different commentaries and things and praying about it, it didn't feel like a sermon for today. It felt like we needed to just kind of go verse by verse, little section by little section. We're going to cover a fairly lengthy uh, passage of Scripture today. And I'll tie together a couple verses. There's two sections. If you look at, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. We're going to begin with verse 20. It's page 762 if you're grabbing a KWC Bible. And as we look at John chapter 12 from verse 20 through the rest of the chapter, you see most Bibles anyway. Uh, and if you're grabbing a KBC Bible, you will find that it's broken into two different sections. In fact, it's titled, Jesus Predicts His Death. And then the second uh, one is called, The Jews Continue in Their Unbelief. And we're going to look through both of these passages today. I'm going to read through, like I said, we'll, we'll address it as we go. The verses will not be up on the screen, uh, except after we've gone through everything, I will come back and we'll take a look at two verses from the first section and two verses from the last section that I see a common thread, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And the common thread has to do with this question. Who or what do you value most? 
don't want you to say that out loud. I, I just want you to really think about that. Okay? And since you're not saying it out loud, you can give whatever answer you want to give because there's nobody next to you to go, really? I don't think so. But here's what I'm going to ask. Just make sure that whatever answer you give is the right answer. You say, well, what's the right answer? right answer is the real answer. Okay. Who or what do you value most? Let's pray. Father, this is your day. This is your time. And as we look at your word, I pray that you would speak to us. The prayer isn't so much that you would speak to us because it is your word. Your word is active the lie that's sharper than a double-edged sword cut straight to the heart you're faithful to speak Lord the prayer really is that we would have ears to listen minds and hearts that comprehend and seek to put into action apply what we hear today and so have your way and your will in this time Pray in and for your name. Uh, another way to ask that question is, who or what are you living for? When you talk about value, who or what are you living for? How, how many of you have ever made a, a bad trade? You've made a bad trade, you look back on it, you thought maybe you were making a good trade, you look back on it and you go, that was, that was a bad trade. We're going to see that in both sections, that there's a, a bad trade-off that sometimes people make. Many, many years ago, before I was ever in the picture, my father-in-law had a, had a really nice Corvette. Really, really nice Corvette. Saw some pictures of it. A yellow Corvette. I mean, back, back in the old days, we're not talking these, these new ones. Okay, this was, again, before I came into the picture. And maybe even before Rebecca was in the picture. But my father-in-law had a, had a really nice Corvette. And, and he decided that he was going to trade that Corvette for an organ. And I still to this day kind of want to say, Papa, what were you thinking? Like, if you had held on to that Corvette, for all these years, and the way that he takes care of cars, I mean, he's a, he's a motorhead, and, and the, if he would have held on to that thing, do you know how much that would have been worth? A whole lot more than it worth, I promise you that. And do you know how much I would enjoy that yellow Corvette? A whole lot more than that organ, I promise you that. <laughs> But he felt that it was a reasonable trade, a wise trade, to go ahead and trade that yellow Corvette that was in awesome condition for an organ. What kind of trades have you been making in your life? Think about that because that will help you to understand value and who or what you're living for. John chapter 12, let's begin with verse... Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. It's the preparation. They're getting ready to celebrate the Passover. And so this is like the greatest of the feasts that the Jews celebrate. And some Greeks are joining in. Greeks are, they're like a lot of us. Like we're not, we're not Spanish, most of us. We're not Mexican or Hispanic, but we will eat Hispanic food. We'll, we'll join in on some celebrations of different things, even if it's not necessarily our culture. And there's some Greeks, they just want to learn. Greeks love knowledge. They want to learn. And some of them have heard about Jesus. So verse 21, they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, because he's Greek, at least his name helps them to see like he may be more likely to listen to us. 
Maybe this is somebody that will help give us an in to Jesus. So they go to Philip. We would like to see Jesus. Philip went to Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. I, I just want to pause there first to just say, people are looking for Jesus. Today, people are looking for Jesus. They may not even completely know that they're looking for Jesus. But they're looking for Jesus. The question is, is, are we people that will help point people to Jesus? They needed, they were looking for somebody, they were looking for Jesus, but they first looked for somebody that could help point them to Jesus, right? Right? And most people, they're looking for Jesus, but they need somebody to help introduce them to Jesus. And I can't help but wonder, in our halls at the school, in our office cubicles, or out, on the, out in the fields, or wherever we may be, is there somebody that's looking for Jesus? And you're the right person in the right place at the right time, a God given place at a God given time to point them to Jesus. And so, we'll, just as we jump in here, just want you to make sure that you've got your eyes open for people that are looking for Jesus and you're looking to point people to Jesus. Verse 23 Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And it's interesting. We just come into this and Jesus just jumps into a, a monologue. And we don't hear anything else from the Greeks. But it's like Jesus is talking to the Greeks and the Jews. And Jesus says something here that we've seen as we've been studying the book of John. He talks about the hour has not come. It's not the right time. And like... He, he keeps saying, it's not the right time, it's not my hour. And now the hour has come. And, and many scholars point to the fact that he's been preaching the word, preaching the gospel, telling people about who he is. He's been telling predominantly the, the Jews, right? The Israelites. Now, the Greeks are hearing the message too. The message is going beyond just the Jews. The Gentiles are getting the gospel message as well and it is time he says the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified we'll pause there we talked about son of man as we've gone through this passage but just in case you haven't been here uh, for previous weeks or maybe you missed uh, when we talked about son of man jesus uses son of man many many times it's used for jesus 88 times in the new testament and the the number one title that Jesus uses for himself is son of man and most scholars point to Daniel chapter 7 where Daniel has a dream has this vision about a son of man that comes so Daniel has a vision a messianic vision about the Messiah okay following the different kingdoms and how these different kingdoms are going to fall and they're ultimately going to have to answer to the king of kings who comes as a son of man. And Jesus picks up that title and uses it for himself. There are other reasons why Jesus would be called the son of man. He's identifying with humanity. He's not just pulling the God card all the time. Well, I'm the son of God, so you got to listen to me. He's identifying. He's 100% man. He's in the flesh. He's a son of man. And it's time for him to be glorified. And glorified is another way of saying worship, which we talked about last week, that Jesus is worthy of worship. So this is actually kind of Jesus is worthy of worship part two. And we're just going to kind of play into more so what it looks like in some values and how this plays out in life and what Jesus has to say about that. Another way to understand glorified is weightiness. Weightiness. 
that there's some weight to who Jesus is, that Jesus outweighs everything and everyone else in our life, that he's the center of our marriage, of our family, of our ambitions, our goals, our, our everything, what we believe, what, how we behave, where we find our security and where we find our identity, what we love and how we love where we go and what we say it all comes back to Jesus that he's glorified that's what it looks like for him to be worshipped so he con continues on I tell you the truth unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies it remains only a single seed those of you that are farmers or have an idea of planting seeds maybe you're not a farmer but you've got a garden you understand this principle that the seed has to die and out of that death comes life so Jesus is using that as an analogy for himself. Then goes on to speak about us. He says in verse 25, The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Those two verses we will come back to later. Verse 27. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Why is Jesus troubled? He's going to die. That's what it means. When he says the hour has come, the, the hour that he's been waiting for, the crescendo of Jesus' existence on earth is, his, is him dying. That's his hour. That's his moment. That's his mission, to come and die. And he's at that point, and he says, now my heart is troubled. There's two things that I want us to think about as we, we read these words, we, we hear these words from Jesus. Number one, I want us to think about Jesus and what he's experiencing in this moment. He says, my heart is is trouble. And what shall I say? I know what people want me to say. <laughs> I know what I, I want to say. But my heart's trouble. There's an internal struggle, right? Because Jesus knows his mission that the Father has given him, that he has chosen before the creation of the world to go to the cross. He also knows that in doing so, it's going to be excruciating and painful. It's not going to be a cakewalk. And we talk about we all have our cross to bear, but we don't have a cross to bear when it comes to the cross that Jesus bared. And so his heart is troubled, and I think we need to really reflect on that, especially in light of taking communion later today. But something else that I want us to think about is if Jesus can say, my heart is troubled, why can't we? How are you doing today? Good. Good. I'm awesome. Baloney. For some of you, right? Can we just can we be honest today? He says, My heart's troubled. Some of you, if if you were just to be honest today, when somebody says, How are you doing today? You'd say, my heart's troubled. I'm facing some things that I don't really want to face right now. I'm going through some stuff that's not a lot of fun. Maybe we don't do that in every single conversation, but if we can't be honest with other people, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, are we really being like Jesus? Because Jesus said... My heart is troubled. 
And I think it would do us well if we would follow Jesus in this as well and learn to be able to say when our heart is troubled and just be real. Jesus was real. So my heart's troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Is like, is that what I should say? Is like, here's, here's what I could say. Should I say, Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. So he says, Father, glorify your name. He didn't avoid trouble when it meant avoiding the will of the Father. And we'll look at it in a few weeks. He'll end up praying, not my will, but yours be done. He submitted to the Father. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. I really wanted to use special effects and have a voice from heaven, you know, like, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Like, I, that would be be cool but this voice from heaven God speaks and says I have glorified it and will glorify it again look at verse 29 the crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered others said an angel had spoken to him here's what I want us to see here God will speak and there are oftentimes two different ways that people will respond to when God speaks one is they'll just dismiss it just flat out no that wasn't God that was the like in this case that was the thunder that wasn't God just dismiss it nah like maybe you've done this before the Holy Spirit speaks it's the voice of God but you dismiss Nah, nah, that's not, that's not God. Just dismiss. Sometimes that's what happens. The other response that often happens is diminish the voice. Okay, sometimes we just completely dismiss the voice. Well, that was thunder. Other times we diminish the voice. Well, that was, it it wasn't God. It, It was a voice that's kind of important, but it's not quite God. It was the voice of an angel. It was a messenger. Here's how this can play out. Sometimes the Lord uses other people to speak into our lives. Messengers. They're not angels, but they're messengers. It may be our parents. It it may be a Sunday school teacher. It may be a co-worker. It might be a pastor. And something is spoken, and it's from the Lord, but we just diminish it and say, well, that's just the pastor. That's just what the pastor says. That's just what my teacher said. That's just what somebody else said. And we, and we diminish it, even though they're sharing, speaking God's word. And so we diminish it. Sometimes we dismiss Sometimes we diminish. Some actually understood that it was the voice of God. Jesus said, verse 30, The voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Who's the prince of the world? Satan. So Satan's going to be driven out. Hard part is, Satan is Satan still present? Turn on the news if you're not sure. Still present. He's driven out though. He's not in authority. Christ is taking care of that. He's going to the cross for the forgiveness of sins. He's going to raise victorious over sin and Satan three days later. He will be driven out. Verse 32, But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, what's he speaking about? Going to the cross, right? 
But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Now, is everybody going to become a Christ follower? Are all men going to become Christ followers with Christ's crucifixion? That would be great, but no. I think the better understanding when we look at all men, like all kinds, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, free and slave, all kinds of people will come to him people from every corner of the earth will come to him. He said to this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. The crowd spoke of, verse 34, we have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever, so how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? And then they ask another question, and who is this Son of Man anyway? Like, which is kind of one of those things, and it's, you can kind of understand where they're coming from, and then we'll go back to the real meat of what is said in, the, in these couple verses. When somebody speaks of themselves using the third person, is that a little confusing? Well, Len likes to do this, and Len likes to do that. The other day, Len went to the store, like, if I spoke like that, you're like, well, who is this Len? There's two of you? Like, you'd, be, you'd probably be a little confused, right? So like, well, who is this son of man? Even though that was a title that Jesus had used for himself and they should have been able to pick up on it, but they're a little confused and they're like, well, we go back to the, you say you're the son of man, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, but we understand that the Christ will remain forever so how can you die and be the son of man when we understand scripture to say that the son of man will live forever and where do they get that well let's just quickly look over a few things where that could come from there are a, a variety of places one first and probably foremost is daniel chapter 7 verse 14 which, again, Daniel chapter 7 is where we see the Son of Man phrase come from. And it says in Daniel 7, 14, He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped Him. Doesn't that sound like just what Jesus was just saying here about all people? It says all people, nations, and men of every language worshipped Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and the king in his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Sounds pretty clear. Jesus is making the connection to being the Son of Man. The Son of Man is going to, is going to come and all will come to know him. All will worship him. All will, will say he's, he's the king, right? And his kingdom will not end. So if you're going to die... Your kingdom kind of comes to an end, right? If you come to an end, your kingdom comes to an end. Without the king, there is no kingdom. So they've got a pretty valid point. And there are other scriptures, Psalm 89, Psalm 110, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. For unto us a child is born. You probably heard this passage before, especially around Christmas time. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He goes on to say, He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. They had part of it right. Scripture does say it will be an eternal kingdom, a forever kingdom. The king will live forever. What they missed and they didn't understand is that the king was going to die but then rise up again three days later. So Jesus has a little more explaining to do. Verse 35. Then Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it, so that you may become sons of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. I'm not going to go into this passage. We talked about Jesus being the light of the world. 
If you weren't here for that Sunday, you can go on to YouTube and just look for Jesus is the light of the world, and you can find out what that is all about. Okay, Jesus, again, just kind of highlights it here. Verse 37, new section. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I love, I love this picture here, the arm of the Lord. And it ties into the graphic that we've been using for Jesus is. It's the familiar picture of a hand reaching from heaven and a, and a hand reaching from earth. One, one hand reaching down and the other hand reaching up. And in many ways, we see this picture in the person of Jesus Christ. He's the arm. Much like if you could just picture as parents with a, a young child. What do we do when we want to make sure that they get somewhere? Grab them by the hand, right? So that they can go with us. And we see to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Jesus is, in a sense... God extending his arm, his hand, to humanity. Saying, come, come to me. I love that picture that we have from Isaiah. Then Jesus goes on. For this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. Okay, we're, we're going to stop and we're going to camp out here for a little bit because this passage is one of the passages that can just mess, mess with people in, in huge ways. And this is one of the passages that sometimes pastors might want to just kind of skip over because it, on the surface, and we take God's word for what it is, right? What it says... He has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. It's like, well, don't you want to heal them? Don't you want to save them? And so it can really create this question of what kind of God is God? Is God a loving God or not a loving God? Does God love everyone or not love everyone? Does God want everyone to be saved or not everyone to be saved? Does God want everyone to know Jesus or not? And traditionally in the church with a capital C, there have been traditionally two different positions when it comes to understanding God's grace in how God's grace is extended to humanity. There's one side that essentially believes that before the creation of the world, God predestined those who would be saved and those who would not be saved, those that would experience eternal damnation. That he just, he chose. He's God and he chose. He makes a choice, those who will be saved, those who will not be saved. And so if you, can, if you read this scripture, you can see it. So there are those that he's going to blind their eyes and deafen their ears, deaden their ears. So they're not going to see, they're not going to hear, they won't respond to the gospel message. And accordingly, they will suffer an eternity in hell. As Wesleyans, we are on an, in another camp where we believe that God is a loving God, that God, and not that I want to 
pause real quickly because I don't want to make this side look like they don't believe that God is a loving God because that is definitely not the case. But in his love, he provides a free will that all humanity has the opportunity to choose whether or not to believe in Jesus Christ. Okay? So typically two different understandings. And here's the thing. If you look at Scripture, there's a reason that the people over here believe what they believe. Okay? Part of it goes back to what we see in Exodus. And if we've been reading the Life Journal, we see in Exodus that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. We also see that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. About 18 times, 19 times, it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. About half of them, it says God hardened his heart, and about half of them, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Okay? There are other verses that talk about God being God, and God just saying, if I choose to do this, who are you to, to question me? And, and really, who are we to question God? If God wants to do it a certain way, guess what? He's God. He gets to do whatever he wants to do, okay? And so again, there are passages of Scripture that I would clearly say I can see where people that believe on this side of things, where, they, where they're coming from. I believe there are also Scriptures that if we look at clearly with objective eyes, we can say, you know what? I can see things over here that say, there is a responsibility. We, there is a free will. There is some openness. There is that God did die for, Christ did die for everyone and that Christ does desire, God does desire that all be saved. That all come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That there, that's his, his desire. So there's a little bit of wrestling with this and here's where I, Here's where I'm going to land with this. And, and I love this because it came from somebody that I would say is, is almost as far over on this side as you can get. I listen to his teaching on this because I want a balanced approach. When, when I'm presenting scripture, not just from the lens that, that I've been taught through Bible college and, and different things, I, I want to be able to, like, what, what is the truth? It doesn't help you to, here's what I think. Like, what, what is the truth? And so I, I'm going to listen to some other perspectives. And I love how he said it, how he presented it, was something along the lines of this. Have you ever tried to get somebody to like you and the more that you tried to get them to like you the more they didn't like you have you ever tried to extend love to somebody only to be met with greater levels of rejection I know parents that would say this of their children The more I try to do for them, the more I try to love them, the more they hate me. And he said, in a, so, so it's the more God does, the more they become hardened in their heart. So it's not that God is intentionally hardening their heart out of hate or out of apathy But actually in his love, trying to extend that love, hardens their heart. You take it as you want. I, I thought that was a pretty good explanation. And it kind of lands in the middle of the two. Whatever the case, they've hardened their hearts. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. I do want to say this. Whether or not we harden our heart or God hardens our heart, 
God can still use a hardened heart to reach somebody else. God can still use a hardened heart for his honor and his glory. One final thing that I'm going to give you with this thought of the more we try to love, the more, and the more particularly that God tries to love, that God does extend his love, and the more it hardens somebody's heart, is to point to something that, that somebody said many times ago, the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. The same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. And so just a good question to think of is your heart ice that will be melted by God's love or clay that will just simply be hardened by God's love? We continue on. Verse 42, Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43, For they loved the praise from men more than praise from God. I want us to sit in these couple verses, so we're going to come back to those. Verse 44, Then Jesus cried out, and I want us to see and understand, John is concluding the public ministry of Jesus with these words. So Jesus is wrapping up. Here's his final words of public ministry. We're going to look at as we continue on through the book of John, we'll see some other things that Jesus says to the disciples that are more behind the scenes. We'll we'll get a, a look into a prayer that Jesus prays for himself, for his disciples, and for the rest of the world. We'll, we'll, get, a, we'll get a lot more about who Jesus is, what Jesus is about. But these are the final words that Jesus has for the public, his public ministry. He cried out, When a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. So we have two things that Jesus has said before. One of them we've, we've seen already just today in today's passage about Jesus being the light. We've also seen as we've gone through the book of John that Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. If you know me, then if you know the Father, then you would know me. This connection. So it's kind of like Jesus is giving a summary. And then he says, verse 47, As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. Like, okay, cool. Keep reading now. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. He already told us that in John chapter 3, verse 16, and then especially in verse 17. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. We see this in John chapter 3, verse 18. That the very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day, for I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say and we've seen that throughout our study of John Jesus only says what the father tells him to say Jesus only does what the father tells him to do and ultimately if we listen to Jesus and we follow Jesus we have eternal life that's what we've seen as we looked at the book of John to this point I want to go back to these two different passages of two verses. Verse 25, anyone who loves their life will lose it. But anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it and have eternal life. Anyone who serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. We have these two words that we see here that I've highlighted. Love and honor. Love and honor. And we're going to see in the other passage, if we seek honor from one place, we don't get it from another. 
And if we seek it from this place, we won't get it from the other. There's a trade-off. Who do you want to be honored by? Who do you care about the most in what they think about you? Who do you value? Or what do you value most? Who or what do you really love? Because Jesus says anyone who loves their life, and life to, does that mean we have to hate life? Doesn't that sound pretty miserable? Did God create us to hate life? And that's what it sounds like. It says, but anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it and have eternal life. Well, that eternal life sounds like a pretty good trade-off, right? So if I hate my life now, then I get eternal life? Oftentimes when Jesus uses these contrasts between love and hate, it's not to be taken so much as literal as to understand the difference between if we love our life in a way that we're just living for this life versus hating our life in that we are not living for this life, we're living for his life. We're living for eternal life. We're living for him. And so in value, as far as making a trade, we're saying, I value this more than that. We can say, I value this life more than eternal life, and we can live for this life. Love this life, and all that this life has to offer, and we'll miss out on everything that that life has to offer. Or we can live for that life, eternal life, life with the Lord, and allow Him to let us experience whatever this life, in this life, that He wants us to experience. There's a trade-off. Let, let me go back to my father-in-law. Why did my father-in-law trade a yellow Corvette for an organ? It wasn't because he valued the organ more than a yellow Corvette. It's because he valued his bride more than a yellow Corvette. And after all their years of marriage... I can guarantee you he would say and I would make that trade any day. He'd love to have the yellow Corvette but his bride was much more important to him. And if she wanted an organ and it took selling a yellow Corvette to make that organ happen bye bye yellow Corvette. So that takes us to the other two verses. At the same time, Jesus did those signs. Many of the Jewish leaders believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly admit they believed. They were afraid they would be thrown out of the synagogue. They loved praise from people more than praise from God. Fear reveals value. What you fear the most reveals what you value the most. Fear also reveals where we trust the least. Trust God the least. They were looking to their synagogue for their value, for their identity, for their security. They wanted to be accepted by others. And instead of putting that on the line and being willing to let go of that and saying, we believe in Jesus Christ, we follow Jesus. They didn't want to acknowledge Jesus before the crowd. They didn't want to acknowledge Jesus before the religious leaders because they knew what that would do to them. What did they value? People. The praise of men. They valued reputation. They valued what others thought of them more than they valued God and what God thought of them. 
which is something we learned about last week from Mary, who cared a whole lot more about what Jesus thought of her than anybody else. But I can't help but wonder how, how many of us are living life And we say that we value Jesus more than people. But if we look at what we're living for, I wonder if that's really the case. When we look at trade-offs, what do we trade off? Instead of spending time with Jesus, we're doing this. Instead of time, time coming to worship, we're doing this. Instead of speaking up and saying we believe in Jesus, we keep quiet. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has said, when it comes to this whole idea of secret Christianity, he said either the secrecy will kill the discipleship or the discipleship will kill the secrecy. In other words, there is no such thing as a secret Christian. I want to close before we turn to communion. There's a very similar passage that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have to these two different verses from two different sections where Jesus spoke and both of these come together. See if you can see the similarities. Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? Verse 26, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Jesus was consistent in what he said. Very consistent. We've got choices to make. There's a trade-off. Who are we going to follow? Who or what do you love? As we prepare our hearts for communion, I'd like for you to just take a moment of silence before the Lord. It may be to reflect on that pain and agony. Why Jesus would say, my heart is troubled. Maybe to think about where your priorities are and where they need to shift. It may be to simply express your love and appreciation for who Christ is and what he's done. But take a few moments.